Today we are starting chapter 10 of the Bhagavad Gita. And this chapter is known as Vibhuti Yoga. Vibhuti means powers. It has actually many different meanings. In Sanskrit, it means expansion, opulence, manifestation, magnificence, prosperity, glory, splendor, abundance, pervading. So you see, it has many different meanings. But if you contemplate on this, there does seem to be some kind of connection between all these words. This chapter is basically about manifestations of pure consciousness and it manifests itself in an expansive manner and it is glorious and abundant. It pervades everything. It is has a beautiful splendor about it. So that gives us the feeling about the manifestation of pure consciousness. So we begin with the verses 1, 2 and 3. The Blessed Lord said, Furthermore, O mighty armed one, hear my supreme words, which I tell you with the wish to benefit you, loving one that you are. The group of gods do not know my origin, nor do the great sages. I am indeed the origin of the gods and of the sages, one and all. He who knows me as unborn and beginningless, great sovereign of the worlds, not confused from among human beings, he is freed from all sins. If we see the very first verse here carefully, it says, Hear my supreme words, which I tell you with the wish to benefit you. A teacher is a guide who wishes to benefit you. He has only your well-being at heart. Just like a mother cares for her child as only the best interest of her child at heart, so also a teacher is only thinking about the best of his or her students. Those of you who are parents understand this very well, that sometimes in order to take care of the children, one needs to discipline them. It's not enough just to be nice to them or to provide them with whatever they want or give in to all their whims and fancies. We know that this is not the right way to raise children. That only results in the children getting completely spoiled and uh, they th they would start throwing tantrums, making unreasonable demands. So, love does not mean only sweet words. Sometimes it's necessary, necessary in order to discipline and train the student that the teacher is firm. So, a good teacher does everything from this perspective, wishing to benefit the student. The Lord too 
pure consciousness too has the same quality. There is a common misconception that God wants me to suffer. All the suffering and the problems in my life, they are because God wants me to suffer. So I have to accept it. This creates a fatalistic attitude and is not very useful. Which God would want his or her children to suffer? The God, as we understand it, through the Bhagavad Gita is pure consciousness, has the qualities of Sat, Chit and Anand, consciousness, truth and bliss. Why would the Lord want you to suffer? We create our own suffering. And then we conveniently blame it on some vague concept of God that we have. God, pure consciousness, is witnessing and is not interested in your suffering, is in fact very compassionate and loving and you get infinite opportunities to grow and develop. Any thoughts or questions on these verses? Okay, then we continue to verses 4 to 7. The discriminating faculty, knowledge, freedom from confusion, forgiveness, truth, control, pacification, comfort, discomfort, being, non-being, fear as well as reassurance, non-violence, equanimity, satiety, asceticism, charity, reputation, disrepute. All of these various kinds of situations of beings happen only from me. The seven great ancient sages and the four manus. My aspects were born of my mind, whose progeny are all these worlds and people. He who knows this magnificence, vibhuti, and yoga in its reality, here becomes united with unshakable yoga. All these words seem to be contradictory. Knowledge and freedom from confusion, discriminative fa faculty and forgiveness, truth, these are similar, but comfort, discomfort, being, non-being, fear, reassurance, violence, equanimity, asceticism, charity. These are opposites. These are the dualities. All the dualities come from pure consciousness. The great sages came from pure consciousness, are all manifestations. The four Manus, these are for, also known as the four Kumars, Sanat, Sanatan, Sanak, and Sad, 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 Sadnanand. And these are considered to be the first among men.
the seven sages were the guides of humanity all these are manifestations and from them came all the progeny or the world as it exists today all the different people so basically these all these forms all these beings all this world all of it is manifestation is a splendid manifestation and one who knows this splendid manifestation here and now is united in yoga Okay, we continue. I think that was fairly clear. This has been a, a theme that's repeating throughout the Bhagavad Gita. Come to verses 8 to 11. I am the origin of all. Everything proceeds from me. Thinking thus, the wise filled with the sentiment of devotion devote themselves to me. Their minds absorbed in me, the pranas entering into me, enlightening each other, narrating about me, they are ever satisfied and ever delighted. To them who are ever joined in yoga and who devote themselves with pleasure and love, I confer that yoga of wisdom, thereby they come close to me. Dwelling in their inner Self, to favor them, out of compassion, I destroy their darkness, born of ignorance with a brilliant lamp of knowledge. Knowing this wonderful manifestation here and now, we be united in yoga and be liberated. One of the most important aspects to note is that those who are on the path, who have seen a glimpse of this, are filled immediately with devotion Having had a glimpse of this, they cannot be shaken from the path. And they seek the company of others like themselves. They like to discuss these things. They like to share these things. And they help each other on the path. This is satsang. All the traditions of the world emphasize satsang. Coming together in the name of the Lord, as it is said by the Christian uh, Bible in Bodh Dharma, the idea of the Sangha is similar to the idea of satsang. Sat is Truth, Sangha is Sangha or gathering, gathering in the name of truth, coming together to share, to discuss, to talk about this. One feels the presence as a living presence when people come together and share this. Remember, satsang does not mean that you have to go somewhere to some teacher. That would also be nice. It doesn't always mean that you have to take up a text like we are right now and study it. It also means keeping the right company. If you surround yourself with thieves, sooner or later... Even if you do not steal, the police is going to come knocking at your door 
asking you if you were involved in some theft or the other. So keeping the company of thieves will get you into trouble with the police sooner or later. So keeping the right company is very important for those on the path. If you keep the company of disreputable characters, you will be in a thumbsick environment. So try to select your friends and your company wisely. This strengthens your practice, it strengthens your sankalpa shakti, keeps you on track on the path. So, any thoughts about this? Any questions? Hmm. Okay. Oh, that's very nice to have Suruvi here. I see that she joined. That's very nice. So we will continue in that case, since everybody seems to be clear about the importance of satsang on this path to help us overcome our ignorance, to strengthen our sankalp. Verses 12 to 18, Arjuna said, The Supreme Brahman, the Supreme Abode, the Supreme Purifier, are you, the Eternal Spirit Purusha, the Divine First God, unborn and un all-pervading. So say all the sages and the celestial sages, Narad, Asita, Devala and Vyasa, and you yourself are also telling me so. I believe all that you are telling me to be true, O Keshava. Neither gods nor demons know your origin, O blessed Lord. By yourself alone you know yourself, O unexcelled spirit, O nurturer of beings, lord of beings, god of gods, master of the world. It behooves you to tell me all your celestial magnificence. Vibhuti, by which magnificence you dwell, pervading all of these worlds. Ever contemplating you, how may I know you, O yogi, in what aspects are you to be contemplated by me? Tell me more in detail your yoga and magnificence, O Krishna. Hearing this nectar-like speech, I am not satiated. Arjun, a very fine, qualified seeker, is not satisfied as yet. He approaches the Lord and pleads for further guidance. He has understood that it is not enough to know the sages or the gods because these are part of this manifestation. It's part of this duality. <clears throat> he has understood that he needs to go beyond these dualities and only the self can know the self. This is a beautiful line which is echoing 
the Bhagavad Gita is echoing the Upanishads. As you all know, the Bhagavad Gita is the juice or the essence of the Upanishads. Some of the verses and some of the lines are actually seem to be taken almost directly out of the Upanishads. And this particular line here, uh, verse 15, you yourself alone, you know yourself, echoes the famous line from the Upanishads which says, only the self knows the self. Thus, you must understand that we cannot know the self as you would know another object. Only the mind understands or knows another object. Mind is a part of this duality. Therefore, you cannot know the self in that respect. As we would understand knowing an object. If I want to get to know a person or a thing, I have to somehow associate with that object. But to know the self, you cannot use the mind. You have to go beyond the mind. And so if the mind cannot know it, what can know it? Only the self itself can know itself. So it means that we need to be established in the self and become a witness. This echoes still another verse from the Upanishads which says, The self alone chooses the self. Which means we can only do our human best. We can do our best, do our practice, evolve spiritually to the best of our abilities. But ultimately we need to surrender. It doesn't mean surrender doing to a person or to something, but it means letting go and learning to be a witness. Referring to Sri Krishna or pure consciousness, these wonderful descriptions like Bhuta Bhava or Bhutesh. This means Lord of Elements, Jagat Pite, Father of the World, or Deva Deva, is God of Gods. With these beautiful uh, words, he describes this pure consciousness which is manifesting in all the elements in the world itself. And he asks him, he pleads again, tell me more. Tell me in detail, how do I know you? How do I get to know you? This is a sign of a excellent student who persists, who has the stamina and who questions, who inquires with the right bhava. Okay, so that's verses 12 to 18. Any questions, thoughts, doubts, comments? Mm -hmm. Okay, nice to have also Manisha who's joined in some time ago I think and um, 
But now, after a long time, nice to have you. <clears throat> so, and Suravi, I'm very happy that it worked out with uh, the connection. Okay, we continue then, in that case. So Ruby uh, and Manisha, just for your information, you can also use the chat um, if you have some questions. Um, but um, preferably, please uh, write your questions or your thoughts to everybody. Um, it's not possible, obviously, for me to respond to private questions um, during the meeting and... Also, since we are sort of in a public <laughs> space here, it's nice to have everybody here talking to each other. But I would request you to keep comments um, uh, short so that uh, there's not a continuous parallel discussion. After all, we want to focus on the matter at hand, which is the verses. Okay, so I have a question. Yes, Meeta. Uh, uh, you just said that we need Agnesh uh, in the cell. Does we, that mean that uh, a form convection that self exists? Mm. Uh, I, can you repeat your question? I didn't hear it too clearly. Uh, you uh, said that uh, to establish in that self in yes. previous verses. Yes. So uh, does that mean that a form that uh, self exists? Yes, definitely. If you have doubts uh, about the self or you have doubts about the entire... You, that, that means you're questioning the basic, the most fundamental aspect of the Bhagavad Gita. The most fundamental aspect of the Bhagavad Gita and all of Sanatana Dharma is that there is a substrata or... Um, a kind of subtle energy which is common and which is everywhere and in all of us and that energy is known as Brahman, uh, is known as God by most people but the word God creates a lot of confusion so we stick to Brahman or pure consciousness and if you have doubts about that itself then of course you cannot be established in it. Those who have doubts normally have the doubts because they have not experienced anything which is like a glimpse, which gives them a sort of an insight, some sort of direct experience, even if it's only a momentary experience. If, if you don't know it even for a moment, then you would have doubts. You, you might not even understand um, what people are talking about and think that this is a whole lot of nonsense. And of course, we have all met such people, people who have doubts to the extent of being very aggressive about it. Most religions in the world as well are dualistic religions. Most religions believe that God is separate from us. God is a creator. God is separate. You can never become one with God. And these based on religions, based on bhakti, continue to strengthen this separation between us and God. So, what happens is that the idea being that the bhakta says, I don't want to become God. I want to adore God. I want to experience God's love. In the Narada Bhakti Sutras, he explains that it is like God is like sugar, it's sweet. 
And the bhakti says, I want to taste the sweetness. I don't want to become sugar. So that duality is then strengthened. So if you don't believe that there is this pure consciousness within you and that you can be established in it, if that doubt is there, then it cannot proceed. You cannot proceed further. That is then the first obstacle. It's one of the greatest obstacles which has been mentioned also in the Yoga Sutras. Okay. Thank you. So the following verses are very long from 19 to 40. So I'm not sure whether I want to read all these verses because the essence of all these verses is the same. So I'm just going to read a couple of these verses um, in between, a few of them, in which Sri Krishna says, Indeed, I shall tell you of my celestial magnificence, but only the main ones. There is no end to my details. Arjuna had asked him to elaborate. He asked the Lord, please elaborate. And so Sri Krishna says, there is no end to my details. An infinite, an eternal. How can you go into details? If we think of the knowledge that is in the world, all the knowables in the world, if you just think about the internet today, there are billions of websites. There are trillions of videos just I think just on YouTube and perhaps even uh, more if you just imagine the amount of books in the different languages this is infinite knowledge there's infinite knowables it is not possible to elaborate on all so Look at the world around you. Look at the objects just in your room. If you just look in your room, just around you, and you'll see there are hundreds of objects just in a small room. So imagine this, the manifestations in the universe. These are absolutely infinite. Sri Krishna says, I am the self. O master of sleep, dwelling in the heart of all beings, the beginning, the middle, as well as the end. So what happens? Because the universe is so large and so infinite, you can't get to know everything. But that same being is in you, dwelling in you, the self. So it's easier to know the self. And the microcosm is equal to the macrocosm. And therefore, know yourself and know all. That is the message. Sri Krishna explains that he is the highest, the finest, the subtle most of all. So it is Beautifully described here in terms of examples of the deities. I am Indra. Indra, as we know, is the king of the gods. Of the senses, I am the mind. Why mind? Because mind is coordinator. Manas is coordinator of all the Indriyas. So he is the highest. Of the commanders, I'm Skanda. Skanda is the lord of war. Kartike is also known as Skanda, the lord of war. Of the lakes, I am ocean. So if you think of all the lakes in the world, the ocean is a big lake. And so, of the lakes, I am the ocean. Among the immovable ones, I am the Himalayas. These are the greatest, highest mountains in the world. So of all things that are immovable, I am the Himalayas. Of the, 
of the weapons and the thunderbolt. What is, whose weapon is that? The thunderbolt is a weapon of Indra. Thunderbolt is basically lightning, which is a very, very concentrated energy. So of all the weapons, I am the thunderbolt, the most concentrated form of energy. Of the cows, I am the celestial wish-fulfilling cow. Of snakes, I am Vasuki. Vasuki is the king of snakes. Among the deities, I am Pralhad. The deities are Asuras. And those of you who know some of the mythological stories would know that Pralhad was a great devotee of Vishnu, of the Lord, uh, even though he was born among the Asuras. So he was the finest of the Asuras. Among the beasts, I'm the lion. The lion is the king of animals. So, of the beasts, I'm the lion. And so that continues. And Sri Krishna explains once again, I'm the beginning, the end, as well as the middle. What does that mean? All. I am all of this. When in English sometimes we use a phrase, we say, oh, you know, you've got to know the, you know, the A to Z of all this. That means the entire alphabet from A to Z, everything. You have to know it. That means you need to know everything. So when you say, I'm the beginning, the middle, at the end, that means I am everything. I am also death. I'm the original of all that comes in the future. So, different examples being created, being explained to convey the same message. <laughs> of secrets, I am silence, and of the knowing ones, I am knowledge. Verse 39. Whatever is the seed of all beings, I am that. There is no moving or unmoving entity that may exist without me. So he says, finally, I am the seed of all beings. If you imagine a seed and a tree comes out of it or a plant comes out of it, pure consciousness is that seed out of which the entire universe evolves. There is no end to my celestial magnificence, O scorcher of enemies. I have told this detail of my magnificences only by way of illustration. So he says, it's not possible to portray this magnificence in words. But here are a few examples to give you a glimpse. Get an idea of it. Pure consciousness, the Lord, however you want to call it, Brahman, is this latent energy which is all-pervading. It is the foundation, the substrata, out of which everything manifests, takes form. It is the out of this formless that the forms emerge. Any comments so far? Okay, in that case, we continue. To the last two verses of this chapter, verses 41 and 42. Whatever aspect they may be filled with magnificence, glory or energy, 
nor each and every one to be born of a particle of my brilliance. Of what use is it for you to know much more? Only with that particle of mine I dwell holding this entire world. In the verses before, Sri Krishna made an attempt to elaborate and describe the magnificence of Brahman, the glory. But it's not possible. It is just enough to know that a sense, that's all we need to know. This is an idea that young seekers have sometimes, that they have to read a lot of books, know a lot of scriptures, and they get on an intellectual track, but it's not necessary to know all these scriptures, to study for years and years. You just need to have some glimpses of that highest truth. You need to know that essence. Once you know the essence, you know it all. You know the substrata, the foundation. These words, once again, echo the saying of the Upanishads, knowing that all is known. You do not need to know all the knowables in the world. You need to know only the essence. Think of electricity. Many of you are sitting in your houses. You have electricity, which makes your laptop function. Without it, your mobiles, laptops, television, household um, gadgets would not function. Can you see the electricity? No. You can see your laptop, you can see your computer, you can see all the household gadgets, but you do not see the electricity that makes it work. The electricity is the energy behind all these gadgets. And without the electricity, all these gadgets would be absolutely useless. So also, it is the self, it's life itself, that's the nature of the Atman, life itself. Without this, the body would be mere dead matter. When you understand that, have a direct insight, and see the glory of the world and see the pure consciousness and energy everywhere, connected, interconnected, then you are established in this pure self. You know the essence. Verse 42 is very clear. It says you don't need to know more. There is nothing more you need to know. In a sense, we can summarize the entire Bhagavad Gita into one line and that says, everything is pure consciousness. That's just one line. It's one of the Mahavakyas from the Upanishads. You are the electricity behind all these gadgets. And all these aspects or these manifestations are only parts of that whole reality. They're just small parts. Generally, the mind is not able to hold the whole. It's too vast. It's too magnificent. 
So the mind focuses only on small parts most of the time. Through yoga practice, through sadhana, we train ourselves to be able to hold the entire magnificence, purnam, the whole, the entire magnificence. Initially, maybe only for a few split seconds, a few moments, but with training, we're able to hold it for longer. To gain mastery in any aspect, some of you are experts in your fields, whether you are in computer science or in music or in um, engineering, you have spent many, many years gaining mastery in that subject. What is it that separates you from the others? If we use an example that most people can relate with, music. Not everybody is a musician, but we all have heard music. Depending on your choices, you like certain kinds of music. But if you are a master in a subject of music, you know how music is put together. You know the notes. Those few notes, those seven notes, can create such amazing, complex pieces of music from different um, genres, you know, different kind of music, but it's all composed of those seven notes. You can try to gain mastery either in one aspect of music whether it's one instrument or one style. But if you really know the foundation of music, those seven notes, you are able to understand how music functions, how it's put together. You can compose different kinds of music or you have an understanding of different kinds of music and you can appreciate it. And that is the foundation. Having that big picture, that's what is important. Not being lost in that small part of the whole. And when you see the big picture, you see the beauty of it. Okay, so any thoughts, questions, comments on this? Radhika ji? Yes. Um, it just seems very difficult, isn't it? I mean, what can a person do? It mm -hmm. seems everything is held in, in the hands of God. He chooses... He encourages, he reveals himself. Mm -hmm. So how, what, is, what is a person supposed to do to, to get that? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I understand that it can get quite overwhelming. <laughs> the Bhagavad Gita, uh, is especially now the next chapter, gets even um, more, uh, you know, the splendor and the magnificence of... The, the self is revealed and it tends, it may seem to be overwhelming and you may feel, oh, how, how, how can I manage, you know, is this possible? And though the Bhagavad Gita says, the Upanishad says, the self reveals the self, please remember this. It also said that the law of karma 
means that whatever you do, that merit will accrue to you. It was, is not lost. It will never be lost. It's carrying your balance, you know, to the next year, like they do in financial years, you know, they carry over the balance. Even if you do not attain in this lifetime, it's carried over to the next lifetime. And you can only do your human best. When you have done your human best, grace comes to you. When that longing in you is very strong, then grace comes to you and you get your glimpses. What you can do is strengthen that longing, strengthen that bhava in you, strengthen the humility and be open to the most beautiful and wonderful gifts of the divine. Most of the time, we are creating our own obstacles. We block ourselves most of the time. And we are not able to strengthen this, uh, this longing in us. The Sankalp Shakti is weak, so we need to strengthen that. And that is the crux of the matter. If we strengthen that, we organize our life so that these parts of our life are of paramount importance, then things will come to you. I have often used this example of a student who, who says, my ambition is to top the class. If his ambition is to top the class, but if he goes for parties every night, Obviously, that's not happening. He's creating conflicts in his life. So if you have this ambition or aspiration to attain, then you also have to organize your life accordingly. You need to keep the right company and need to strengthen that longing in you. And this is all you can do. There is actually not much that you have to do. The rest is going to be taken care of. There is a lovely example from the Yoga Sutras. It gives the example of a farmer in the field. You know, many fields, to this day in India, the fields are watered through little canals. If anybody has been out in the countryside, you see, they have little canals. And the farmer doesn't take a bucket of water and, you know, water his fields. When the fields require water, he breaks open this mud dam that they have built. They build a little mud dam with their own hands, which blocks the water. When the field requires water, they break open that dam. When it doesn't require water, they close the dam. They just put some mountain of, you know, small little heaps of earth there and block the flow of the water. If the water is the energy that's flowing, all you need to do is remove your own obstacles. And the energy starts flowing on its own. You do not have to make the energy flow. All you have to do is remove the obstacles. So, my dear Renu, I would say we should not become fatalistic. That is not the message of the Bhagavad Gita. It does not say only God decides. It says the self chooses the self, provided you do your 50%. If you don't do your 50%, then you cannot attain these glimpses. So you will have to break down those obstacles. That's what you have to do. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. <laughs> it's quite a difficult thing, but it does make sense. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. I must say, Renu, I don't agree with you. I don't think it's difficult. We make it sound difficult. <laughs> yeah? 
that's how the mind is set up you know we have that's another conditioning of the mind we have created this idea oh this is difficult and then we make it complicated <laughs> and then we say oh this is not going to work you know i'm not ready for this and so we sort of talk ourselves into this that you know this is difficult but if i say all you need to do is practice twice a day whatever you are practicing on a regular basis and organize your life so that those two times a day are sacrosanct organize your life so that you can strengthen this uh longing in you and the rest will come Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yes. We need to only begin with the simplest thing. Often people say, "Oh, I want to practice five hours a day." <laughs> you know, you don't have to practice five hours a day. You just need to practice ten minutes every day, and that's enough. So if you set your expectations too high, if you have unreasonable targets that you set for yourself, then in this way you create obstacles for yourself simplify your life have simple goals say 5 minutes in the morning and 5 minutes in the evening and if you can do that already for a few months then maybe you are ready for the next step yes so that's how one does it it's it has to be daily but what happens normally is that people start saying oh um No, I'm a very busy person. I don't have time, and I say to myself, "How is that possible?" Because some very, very busy people have still organized their life so that they can do their practice, even though some of these busy people work for maybe twelve, fourteen hours a day. It's merely a matter of priority. It's prioritizing your life. I have seen very often. the people tell me oh i i can't come for this retreat i'm very busy <laughs> then i find that they have time to go for long holidays so where did you find time for that or you say oh i i don't have time to attend the online meetings i'm very busy but then you have time to watch movies or whatever else nothing wrong with doing all those wonderful things they make your life very interesting and enjoyable but it's a matter of priority when you really want to do something you will do it so all you need is to strengthen that sankalp shakti have simple easy to achieve goals nothing complicated and keep doing it patience is required just keep doing it it's the law of karma if you do something you will get the fruit of it it will fructify so if you do your practice and you keep doing it it has to fructify that is the law of karma okay so next session is going to be um the next chapter already which is yogic vision wonderful uh chapter uh, wonderful um, inspiring and glorious and um, i'm looking forward to it and looking forward to seeing you all next time next friday same time bye bye everyone bye radhika ji thank you so much bye 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 wish well bye everyone Yes and thank you everybody also for your questions for your participation makes this much more interesting